coming home from London last week. I got on a train at Charing Cross and um, there is a protocol when you get on a train at Charing Cross. As you go into the empty carriage, there are usually two or three columns of seats and they're usually arranged in groups of four and you have an option on sitting on the seat next to the window, leaving the seat next to the aisle free and therefore giving leg room to anybody else who wants to sit next to you or you can sit on the outside aisle seat and stretch your legs out and then tut loudly as someone else, another passenger comes onto the train and asks, has the audacity to ask to sit down. I got on at Charing Cross and I decided that I would do the Jesus thing. That I would sit next to the window, allowing anybody else easy access to a seat on their journey home. And true enough, we travelled out of uh, London, got to London Bridge, and uh, someone uh, got on, uh, well, lots of people got on, and made their way to the seating area where I sat down. Uh, they jumped into the seat, slammed the arm down, uh, armrest down, almost decapitating, decapitating my elbow? Can you decapitate your elbow? I don't think you can, but you get the point. I'm thinking someone has had a very bad day. So uh, the train fills up and fills up and fills up and we start travelling through South London and into Kent, into Seven Oaks, on to Hildenborough and we approach Tunbridge. As we are coming into Tunbridge Station, I lean to the gentleman who has uh, sat down uh, next to me and said, uh, sorry mate, I need to... Uh, I need to get out. He had his headphones on and he was reading his phone and he sighed and he looked up and he looked that the aisle was pretty full and he turned to me in a gentle voice and said, you'll have to wait. Someone's had a very bad day. So I said, well, mate, that's fine, but I've got my jacket and my bag on the rack and the train only stops in the station for a certain while and I'm, I've got to get off here and he went <sighs> and with you know all the bad grace that he could muster he stands up and he stands next to the table like this giving me this much space to get out I am a big bloke and so I have to, I get up and I edge round this table as much as I can, but I do brush up against him. And it was at this point that in audible tone, he said, flipping twit. Now, I think we all know that's not exactly the language he used, <laughs> but Gareth's got a P45 in his back pocket with my name on if I tell you what he really said. At that moment, there was a moment of silence. A moment of silence as the rest of the carriage wants to see how I will react. I'm getting my jacket down and my bag off the rack and it's deathly silent. And all I can tell you is that I found myself getting in touch with my inner De Niro. <laughs> I put my jacket on. I looked him square in the face and said, you talking to me? <laughs> you talking to me? <laughs> I'm not proud of my response. I know I should have led him to Christ at that moment. <laughs> I know we should have knelt together had there been room and prayed. There was, what can I tell you, there was a lot of staring with one, uh, at one another and then there was a brief but robust discussion as to which door I was going to use to exit 
uh, the train. I'm not proud of myself. This is an act of confession. I find silence tricky. And so do the people that we read about in our text this morning. Mark chapter 15 and the first uh, few uh, verses there. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders and teachers of the law and the whole of the Sanhedrin reached a decision. They bound Jesus and led him away and turned him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of. But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed, because silence is tricky. Now, it was the custom at the feast to release a prisoner from the, uh, to the people, uh, sorry, release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionist who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate, knowing it was out of envy that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they began to shout all the louder, crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The priests had uh, dragged Jesus before Pilate. And whenever I think of this uh, uh, moment, I remember Caesarea's uh, picture of this exact moment. The priests have got together overnight. They've come up with a plan how they're going to stitch Jesus up. And very early in the morning, Mark says, very early in the morning, yes, soon after dawn. Why soon after dawn? Because a Roman day started at sunup. Get in the queue. You snooze, you lose. They have to take him to Pilate because Jews cannot execute people. They don't have the legal power. Also, the Jewish leaders knew that Jesus was, well, kind of popular with some of their number. And so to get Pilate to sacrifice Jesus, well, that was very convenient and put them at a distance. And Pilate was a good bet. Because he was cruel, he was ruthless, he was immoral. He was of the opinion that Jews should understand when they are beaten. Pilate was cruel, but he wasn't stupid. He knew there was an agenda. He knew that the the chief priests were envious of Jesus. So, was he claiming to be God? Why didn't the Jewish leaders say, look, this guy is claiming to be God? Why? Because they knew Pilate would say, welcome to my world. In Rome, there are many, many gods, and one more, there's always room. No, they went for king of the Jews. Why did they go for king of the Jews? Well, because it had a political tone. He was a political threat, or so that they were trying to say. He was there to oppose Caesar. And so Pilate asked him, so come on then, laughing boy. Are you king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say. And of course there is an uh, an irony here. Because last week when Palm Sunday was going on, 
He came into Jerusalem, not on a horse, not as a general, not as a soldier, not as someone to overthrow Jerusalem, but as someone who came as a servant, as a messenger from God. In other uh, Gospels, we read that the, uh, the Jewish leaders lay it on really thick. Yeah, yeah, he's incited riots. He's telling people not to pay taxes. He's, t- he's starting a, a, a revolution all around Judea. Pilate doesn't take them seriously. But he is struck by the silence. Because Pilate has had men plead and beg and grovel. But Jesus stands there, dignified. His presence, his silence is troubling. But Pilate isn't falling for it. Pilate looks for a way to thwart the Jewish leaders, the Sanhedrin. He wants to do the right thing. So he turns to the crowd. Now, this is a crowd of Jews from Jerusalem. The Palm Sunday pilgrims were there camped outside Jerusalem in the countryside. The Jewish leaders have been smart. Let's get it done early before the Galileans wake. So Pilate comes up with three points being a good Baptist boy. He wasn't really, just in case you're wondering. Pilate says to the crowd, so who do you want? Barabbas, the terrorist? Or this Jesus? Well, you ask the crowd. And all the crowd is hearing, well, do we want what the Jews want, Jewish leaders want, or what the Roman leaders want? The Jewish leaders win. What do you want me to do with this king of the Jews? Second strike. Because Pilate's thinking, even if a grain of this is true, that he has stood up for the Jews, surely that will throw it in his favour. But all the crowd here is Pilate versus the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin win. Well, what do you want me to do for him? Surely you'll settle for just a beating. Crucify Crucify comes the response. Pilate's given Jesus three strikes and three strikes and Jesus is out. And what's more, the crowd are getting unruly and this looks like it could turn out to be a riot. And one thing that Pilate doesn't need is a riot. So sentence is announced because there are rules and every criminal knows, needs to know what his fate will be. And Jesus stands there and is silent. And silence can be tricky. There was a preacher that I heard a long time ago that said this, that if you can't hear from God, one of two things are true. Either you have become perfect or you have become deaf. A little harsh in my view. However, there is the silence of tragedy. Standing at the foot of my mother's hospital bed, I know I'm not allowed to pick up the charts. I know I don't know what all the little squiggly lines mean. But I do know what the sentence at the bottom of the flip chart, of the, uh, uh, of the file said, this woman is dying. Palliative only. I read it out to my brothers who were gathered around the bed. Silence. There was nothing more to be said. It was hopeless. There were no bridges that were Buildable. There was nothing to appeal to. Communication was at an end. In this situation, the hatred of the Jews, the cowardice of the Romans, had become impenetrable. 
They just couldn't hear God speaking. And God save us if we find ourselves in a similar position. There's also a silence of fear. If you ever have the privilege of meeting and praying with someone who has suffered abuse, there are times of silence because fear has grabbed their troubled minds. There's the silence of hurt. No angry words, we're past anger. This silence is a deep sorrow. Sitting with parents whose children are addicted to drugs or alcohol and need to go on the recovery course. Great job, mate. There are no words. It's just a silence of hurt. Then there is a silence of contempt. Whatever is going on just isn't worthy of response. There is a member on TBC staff team who rolls her eyes better than anyone I have ever met. Her name will remain a secret. I fear for my safety. And I can ask her a question or make a comment. The eyes roll, the silence descends, and I feel that I am on my own. And then there is a silence of admiration. The greatest compliment, sometimes silence at the end of a performance is worth a whole bunch more than applause. It's almost rude to make a sound. It's great, don't get me wrong, it's great to be thanked in words, but a look, the eyes well up, because admiration, gratitude, runs through the human being. Well, that is worth an hour of applause. And that, my friends, is what I believe is happening here. That's the silence, or part of the silence we encounter here. How do we know about this incident? How do we know what went on between Pilate, the Sanhedrin, and Jesus? Simply this according to the commentators, that the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin, some of the Sanhedrin who were there trying to stitch Jesus up in the silence, in the silence, they hear God speak. The crowd are going mad. People are shouting accusations. But in the silence... They hear God speak.
Let's pray together. Let's pray. Maybe as we bow our heads and close our eyes or whatever we want to do as far as prayer is concerned. Maybe you would like to pray with someone. Maybe you have been hunting for God's voice in all sorts of places and have found it in the silence this morning. I recommend that you go and be prayed for by the prayer team just in the top left-hand corner. Don't have to say anything. Allow them to pray for you. Allow them to enable you to hear God's still voice. Father, we thank you and acknowledge you as a God who speaks. Sometimes in the earthquake, sometimes in the wind, sometimes in the fire, and sometimes in the silence. Father, as we enter into this time of Lent, as we begin to think about laying things down, taking up new things, better habits. Father, could it be that we just need to turn the noise down? Whatever that noise is, wherever it comes from, maybe we should just turn the noise down. Father, Please speak. Your servants are listening. Father, hear us as we pray. <coughs>